And back on the electric blue, I've got some new potentiometers that I'm going to use for it instead. These are the spline ones. I don't know what I was thinking trying to get these short ones into the small circuit. But nonetheless, you can see I've got two of them out and I've got another two more to go. And then I'm going to put in these new potentiometers and maybe do another test just to see where we left off. I got all four of them out, but I wanted to stop for a second and point out that I had to break out the low melt solder to get these final two out. And I've got a lot of cleaning up to do. I did okay with the wick on this one, the second one that I took out. But these two in here, eh, as you can see, I've got too many components nearby. And I didn't want to risk getting the soldering iron up against them, especially these nice capacitors right here. And I don't think I touched anybody. I think I only touched where I was supposed to. And that low melt solder, it really, really, really does help. But now I've got to clean this stuff out. And this is where I'm going to use uh, my solder sucker and this, uh, whatchamacallit, tip. If I can get into the camera here. This tip is a little bit... Um, uh, it's pointed more. It's got a name. I can't think of what it is right now. But I hold this on one side of the board, usually vertical, like so. And then the solder sucker on the other side. And just get it right out. The board is clean, and I just wanted you to see the difference in these potentiometers. These are the old ones at the bottom. These are the ones I'm going to put in. Uh, before I do that, I need to cut off these little tabs here on the side. And you don't actually just like cut them off what I do is hold it and I just sort of like bend and twist and snap them off instead but um, by doing that it allows me to get this flush into the enclosure otherwise I'd have to have like a notch in the enclosure which is what it's for so that you can get like more stability but I don't need that this will be plenty got it wired back up for a quick test this is the dirt Oops, I accidentally unpowered it. <laughs> Pretty silly, huh? I might want to try to figure out a way to tone that back, but for now... I'm fairly satisfied with this. The next phase for this is getting it into an enclosure. But I'm going to move on to the next circuit, which is the Super Squish. And it is a um, Ross based clone compressor. Or it's a compressor clone based on the Ross, which we can talk about later. Pardon the noise. I'm about to work on the Super Squisher. But look what just came in the mail. Yeah, let's have a look inside. Oh my. This is going to have to be for another video, I'm afraid. I pulled the resistors that I'm going to need for this PCB, and I'm going to go ahead and solder them on now, and then I'll pull the capacitors later. Uh, let's see, of note is this 0 ohm resistor that I'm going to use as a jumper. These things are actually pretty cool. People ask, like, what's the point of that when you can just use a wire? Well, it's more of, an, of a, a visual thing at times, but it's also important for prototyping, like actual prototyping, to make sure that you've got the space necessary in the PCB if you want to use a resistor or maybe if you don't want to use a resistor. In this particular case, I could just use a wire. I'm going to use these because I got them. All of the resistors and diodes have been soldered in. I will do the capacitors next, but I'm going to wait until tomorrow before I do that. Might as well just go ahead and continue being lazy. I pulled all of my capacitors and I have uh, the transistors ready to go. Of note is this Crazy 105 Tantalum, which is polarized. Um, we always hear these bad things about Tantalum capacitors, but the circuit calls for it, so I'm going to use one. I've got these cheaper components over here for uh, bypass capacitors, but the rest of them are you know, fairly good ones with the exception of the electrolytics. I mean, you can get good electrolytic caps, but they're still just going to be crap anyways. These two resistors are left over because I'm going to need to use them for the trim pot. This one doesn't, this particular version doesn't use a trim pot, even though there is um, a footprint for a trim pot. What I'm going to do instead is go by what the uh, diagram here says and uh, try to build this little resistor configuration. And I'm using my cheaper resistors for this because they have thinner legs, and I figured the thinner legs will do better when I need to double up to go into that one hole there. Apart from that, 
me think for a second. Yeah, these two, I tried to match these two resistors to be as close as possible because they are forming a voltage divider where the trim pot is going to be. So I wanted them to be as close as possible. They're both reading about 996 ohms. And then for the five transistors that I've got here, I looked at the, uh, the schematic and I think that two of them are kind of forming a sort of like sub network, not really a long tailed pair or anything like that, but they, you know, or, or push pull configuration. But they seem to be like connected together, so I want to find two of these that have close ratings. What I'm going to do is I'm going to measure them using one of my tools, and I'll show you that here in the, in the next clip. But I'm going to measure these and try to get them um, matched as closely as possible. But first, let's go ahead and, and focus on getting the capacitors soldered into the PCB. I almost made a mistake, but I think I caught my blunder. I was about to use three uh, 100 nanofarad capacitors instead of three 10 nanofarad capacitors. Now the reason why I think I started this is because one of them is indeed a bypass capacitor when I look at the schematic. And for those you normally do use a 100 uh, nanofarad capacitor which is also called a 104 which is also called a 0.1 microfarad capacitor. So as you can see it gets really confusing pretty quick. So these are the 104s that I was going to use and they didn't fit into the uh, footprint on the PCB and I was going to bend them but I thought no hang on a second I've got these 104s as well but then I realized no wait a second that's 0.1 U I need 0.01 U and that's what these are these are the 10 so looking back over here here's what I got so far uh, this one is actually supposed to be a 103 not a 104 but I'm going to keep it as a 104 because if it truly is a bypass capacitor then it shouldn't it shouldn't matter if it's a 103 or 104 uh, especially for a compressor like this I would only think that it would make any kind of difference with a super high frequency kind of switching thing and like even like a digital circuit but I'm probably speaking way out of my league right now at any rate I think everything is going okay and uh, we'll get back to you once the capacitors are all in correction four 103 capacitors not three all of the capacitors are soldered in. I got one blank one, as you can see here. I've also got a couple blank resistor spots, but that's just the way that it is with this particular modification. Uh, coming over here to the transistors, I measured them. This is what I use, and this, these are the characteristics that I'm using for uh, the ones that I'm trying to match. And these are the two that I've decided are similar. And so the reason why I'm trying to match them is just because if we look here at the schematic, Q3 and Q4, just when I see a, a configuration like that, it just makes me think that those two probably need to be matched uh, to the best of, of their capability. But I could be wrong with this one. I'm not exactly sure what kind of configuration this is, and it may not be necessary to match them. But hey, you know, might as well go ahead and get them matched. Not going to hurt anything, I don't think. All five transistors have been soldered in, which, by the way, they're just 2N3904 NPN transistors. Nothing really special. Uh, I did manage to get these two resistors into where the trim pot is supposed to be and that turned out pretty well. So what I'm going to do next is just get some wires in and I'm going to sort of test things around the circuit, just really just voltages before I put the IC in. And uh, when I put the IC in, I'll talk about that more. I will say though that I am at a crossroads because I want to use a socket, but I'm not going to once again because this is a guitar pedal and it theoretically will be stepped on and stomped on by barbarian guitar players. So that being the case with the socket, the IC will get knocked loose eventually, and it is better to solder them in. The, the, the reason why I use the socket is because you're thinking that you want to be able to take the, the, the IC out and use it on something else or replace it with another IC of, of a similar type kind of function. In this particular case, though, no. This is one, one IC is only going to fit into this. It's a CA3080, I believe. I'll get to that again when, when, I, when I get to that. But uh, yeah, let's go ahead and get some wires in this thing and just test the voltages and make sure that everything checks out okay. The circuit is powered up and things seem to be okay. I checked the voltages where the operational transconductance amplifier is going to go and everything seems fine there. Again, I'm really not familiar with the circuit. So um, what's going into the, uh, the inverting and non-inverting inputs, it looks like a proper bias voltage. And what's interesting about these ICs is that they're operational transconductance amplifiers. They're more than just operational amps. And basically they have an additional terminal which does things that to tell you the truth I really don't know. It's pretty darn complicated. I'm still learning about these things. But in essence 
they open up the doors for a lot of flexibility for options from understanding like multiplexing, sample and hold circuits, and apparently compressor circuits, which is what this is. So here I have two of the CA3080 chips, these small uh, eight pin ones. These are some other chips that we'll get into later, but I have two in case I mess up. And you know what? I'm going to um, not use a socket on this. I'm going to solder these directly in. And by the way, this is a large scale a discrete component operational amplifier, just sort of a regular conventional one. And um, it just the, uh, what I, the reason I wanted to show you this is because inside of these little tiny packages are really just a whole bunch of transistors and resistors. Um, so, you know, that's that. But that's, that's a story for another day. The operational transconductance amplifier is soldered in, and now I'm going to put the pots on top of it. I'm not going to make the same mistake that I made last time. And reminder once again to uh, cut off those little tabs on the side. Let me see if I can get it there. Yeah, the, right there on the left. You just snap those off. And I like to use a tool like this handy tool right here. It appears to be working. Here's a final test. And I really have no idea what this stuff does. This is clip. And this is the attack. If I turn it down, it tends to get louder. That makes sense, I guess. The amount of sustain, get real gnarly with this. Okay, I will do further testing on this, probably pull out an oscilloscope and my function generator and just make sure that it's doing a compressor type kind of thing. But, you know, I need to kind of really figure out what this particular compressor is supposed to do. You know, what is the sustain and attack and clip? What are their actual functions? But so far, this uh, I'm going to call this a success. At least I think it is. You know, you never know until the proof's in the pudding, right? And the final stage here is to get these into the enclosures. And this is probably the hardest part of the whole thing. So that's going to be part three. I'm going to wrap it up for now and see you next time. <laughs>